everybody this is Jen welcome to my channel today we are ending one month and starting another what's that mean for the garden well stay right here and I'll tell you right on garden Jen's journey So we are ending July and starting with August and there's a lot going on in the garden. It's a little behind because of our wonky weather, but there's a lot to show you. So let's head on out to the garden. Our ducks are in our container area just taking a break from their work. They are my organic pest control. They all eat all the snails and slugs and grasshoppers and any bugs that are on the ground that uh, um, they are interested in. They eat them and some of the weeds as well. So they're yelling at me because I woke them up from their, their little cat nap, so to speak. Um, but yeah, uh, these are khaki campbell ducks and they're very good for your garden because they eat the bugs but not your garden. So these, these are my Calypso bush beans. They are a dry bean and they are doing very well. Uh, they took a while to get going and I was kind of concerned that I was not going to get any beans. But you see here we got quite a few going on here. There's quite a few. And again these are a dry bean. So those beans will sit on the plant until the plant matures and dies in the fall and those pe uh, bean pods dry out. We got some there and we have some here. Not a lot because I had a limited stock of beans so it's mostly going to be for seed saving so I have enough beans to plant next year but we're also going to have enough left for about a meal. So we can actually try them and see how we like them compared to some of the other dried beans. You see my onions here? They are doing very, very well. Probably the next video you will see, as long as the weather's being nice, we're going to harvest these bad boys. But aren't they gorgeous? You can see how big they are. These are my other onions here in these pots and again you can see the nice size that they are. Tiny man is making sure that uh, we are giving him due attention. Alright so we are entering the main garden area and we're going to see what's in here. Uh, this is the uh, last year we're going to be using this as a garden uh, for before the sabbatical rest. Uh, we have been here, it'll be seven years in September. So um, the following season, the following gardening season will be our seventh gardening season. And we let the land rest every seven years. So next year we won't be planting anything here. This will be resting. And whatever grows will be growing of its own accord. So it'll be interesting to see what the garden looks like uh, next year at this time uh, compared with what it's looking like now just by letting it rest and any volunteer crops coming up. My rose garden's looking pretty good. My zinnias have finally uh, blossomed. I only have a couple of zinnias because with COVID and everything I got too far behind to really get my flowers going. So there's some zinnias, and you see the beautiful, beautiful uh, peachy kind of rose, it's gorgeous. We are dealing with Japanese beetles, I can see that there's quite a few Japanese beetles, right there's one on my rose petals, there's another one right there. 
so I'm gonna have to spray these guys with uh, some neem oil when uh, the bees are, have gone to bed my medicinal garden I have cut down a couple of the flowering um, medicinal herbs like this is valerian I cut that down because we don't want the seeds to spread because it spreads like crazy if you're not careful so this is already starting to regrow when you cut it down it uh, stimulates new growth so it's already starting to grow again <clears throat> and then the cone flowers they're doing very very well probably going to harvest some more echinacea root this fall and split these because they're finally established enough where they're really starting to multiply every year so it's time to get these guys thinned down a little bit and uh, move these flowers out to my front flower bed which is really starting to take off as well and we have lots of milkweed going on um, you might see some monarch butterflies fluttering to and fro right now because this is the time of year they come in and monarch butterflies need the milkweed plants in order to eat and reproduce and right now our monarch butterflies are becoming uh, close to being on the endangered species list so it's vital that even though this milkweed is a weed that you let it be let's see there's one that landed right there let's see if I can take you in that's a monarch butterfly. So they need the milkweed plants. So we leave them alone. As long as they're not like in the main path or really crushing some, some other plant, we leave them alone. So the monarchs have a place to uh, reproduce. The bee balm. The one thing I hate about bee balm, if I can say that there's anything to hate about plants, is the powdery mildew bee balm is a beautiful plant these flowers are really pretty uh, i have another one back at the entrance i just cut down uh this week it's uh red flowers where these are purple but uh the bees love them i love them except for the powdery mildew and no matter what i do you know we get the powdery mildew here but it is what it is <laughs> then we got our elderberry bushes that have grown like humongous those are at least nine foot tall because they're almost as tall as the the garage here um, but they're doing really good I uh, started to get some tent caterpillars this year so I have to spray with some BT when the Sun goes down and that should take care of that and then our grapes are growing quite wildly right here um, later on in the fall I will train them a little bit more but they're only four-year-old grapes, so they're just starting to get really established. So they're doing really good. My fig tree is starting to come up. It's a little behind. These are Chicago figs, which die back every year and shoot off brand new growth. So they're not like a, a different kind of fig tree that stays a, a tree every year and produces new fruit. This produces a brand new tree and fruit every year. So. Yeah, this, this is a little behind as well. We'll see if we actually get some figs from it. Then our tomatoes are doing all right. My asparagus bed that I had transplanted from a different part of my garden last fall, it is showing that it is happy where it's at. Um, it's gone to seed. It's doing good. So in a couple of years, we'll see um, if this actually is producing some nice spearheads. This trellis is my Blue Lake pole bean trellis. I'm trying Blue Lake. I usually grow Kentucky Wonder pole beans for the green snap bean variety, but I was told to try the uh, Blue Lake because uh, it has a higher yield, so to speak, than Kentucky Wonder. So we'll see. Um, we had that freak frost and it killed about half of these guys, so I had to replant. So this trellis is way behind it should be very very full of bean plants by now as far as being all the way up the trellis like some of my other trellises which I'll show you this is my lima bean trellis and then I have a pot in the back with some rosemary and canna lily and then uh, my rhubarb this is the one that's right next to my rose area but they are doing pretty good uh, lima beans need it very warm and hot 
and so they're a little behind but they're they're starting to really catch up you can see them growing up the trellis pretty good these are old mother stollards they're a dry bean you can see they're filling in this trellis nicely this is what my green beans should be looking like this full and far up the trellis but because of that frost and we having to start all again they're really behind so we'll see if they catch up because this is now just august and we still got about uh two months before the frost so we'll see two months is not a lot of time but at the same time a lot can happen in two months Tucked in with my beans, I have uh, tomatoes growing because I wasn't sure what, where I was going to put some tomatoes since I don't have a lot of space for tomatoes with the way my garden's set up this year. And I figured I'll put them next to the pole beans and because they're indeterminates, the pole beans can help attach them to the trellis, uh, stake them so to speak by wrapping around them. So that was kind of my mentality. And uh, they're doing all right. I've got some tomatoes go growing on them. And then I have some roselle, which is the uh, hibiscus that's used in herbal tea. It comes from the roselle plant. So I have some of those there. This is broom corn. It's supposed to be rainbow broom corn, but I'm not really seeing rainbow colors. It's all green. But the tassels are starting to form at the top. And as these get bigger, this is what you make corn broom out of. So it doesn't really look like a lot right now, but in about a couple months, you'll see why it's called broom corn. This is my Indian dried corn. It's doing really good. Uh, this is one of the things I had to protect from the ducks because uh, the ducks like corn leaves. <laughs> you can see I'm missing quite a few leaves. But all in all, it's doing very, very well. I have two beds of this because um, I'm gluten-free on a gluten-free diet. And so I don't eat wheat as far as tortillas and things like that. So I'm growing my own dry corn so I can make my own uh, corn tortillas, corn chips, things like that. So I have quite a few uh, corn plants growing for that. My hollyhocks are reaching their peak. My black ones reached their peak. Um, they started ahead of these ones and I already started cutting them back because you don't need a lot of seed pods to replant them. And I didn't know I had um, uh, more hollyhocks than I thought. I knew I had a pink and a dark pink. But then this year, when the this group here bloomed, I realized that I have a pink and a dark pink single type blossom. And then I have a pink and a dark pink double blossom is what those ones are called. Uh, they kind of remind me of carnations. They're really, really gorgeous. So I was like, oh, that is so cool. So I'm definitely going to be saving seeds from these two um, just because I really enjoy the fullness of those flowers. And I think they'll look really good out in my front flower garden. This is another bean trellis that is not doing very well because of the cold snap. Uh, this is supposed to be Hadassah uh, shield bean, dry bean. And um, right behind me is the Blue Lake uh, pole beans. So these two trellises are what got hit the hardest for the beans. So you can see they're still low to the ground. They really haven't grown too far up the trellis yet, uh, but we'll see. Again, we have two months left of the growing season here, um, so we'll see what happens within the next month. This is my other dry corn patch, along with some sunflowers that I planted here. This one is a Velvet Queen, and then the ones in the back are Hopis. So they're doing pretty good. I'm not sure if this one's a Hopi or not. I'll have to look when the, the seeds start forming. Let's see if I can take a quick peek in here. 
Yep, can't quite tell yet, but the Hopis, when their seeds start forming, they're a blue seed and you use them for dyeing. So we'll see how this one turns out. I don't think it's a volunteer, but it could be. And then this is where my marshmallow was, um, my marshmallow plant. It too, like the elderberry, grows really, really, really tall. Um, but when it flowers, after it's done flowering, you have to cut it down or the seeds are going to go everywhere in your garden. I have been pulling baby marshmallow plants up out of my garden all summer. <laughs> but it's okay because when they're when they're young they're very easy to pull out once you see them but yeah basically any plant that flowers if you don't want it spreading in your garden and it and it propagates by seed uh, spreading you want to cut it down after it flowers to prevent the seeds from going everywhere so this is one of my last beds this one has my catnip plant which I saved from my cats eating it like crazy. If you watch my uh, earlier videos this year, you'll notice, and let me see if I can zoom in for you. Down at the base, I have a milk crate that is actually over the base of the plant, and it prevents the cats from eating the plant down to absolutely nothing. Um, and then it kills it. So. Um, I covered the base with the milk crate and then it can grow out of the milk crate just fine and you can see it's a very vigorous healthy plant so I'm really excited it's gone to seed the bees are loving it um, catnip is a wonderful plant to have it doesn't spread too bad kind of uh, it's a lot different than some of the other mints um, which can really send runners and spread like crazy this one spreads a little more slowly and it's easier to pull out of the ground. But it has a lot of great medicinal purposes uh, for some teas and things like that, as well as being great for the pollinators. These are tiger eye pinto beans. Um, they're a bush variety, but it's kind of more like a bush cross with a pole bean, if I could explain it better because this bush bean uh, bush actually gets about four foot tall. And so it sends up runners kind of like a vine bean um, in order to hold itself up. So um, it's growing very well. These uh, took off a little slowly, but now they are really, really starting to grow. And I'm starting to see quite a few bean pods on there. Let's see if I can zoom me in there and see quite a few bean pods there. And these are a pinto bean. So again, these will stay on the on the bush until the bush is completely mature and dies back and the beans in the pods have dried. Next to them is my raspberries that I transplanted. So I'm glad to see that they're doing pretty good after being transplanted. I lost about half of them. But um, if you know anything about raspberries, Raspberries can uh, propagate very quickly if they're in the right environment. So even though I lost half, this will soon fill out anyways and we'll be good to go. My hops plant is really, really taking off. It's almost to the top of the fencing here on the back side of the chicken coop. So it's doing very, very good. And we shall see how many uh, hops clusters I can uh, get this fall when it's time to harvest them and that'll be a great addition to my medicinal herb supply. This is the Trifano Violetto pole beans. They're really starting to take off. They're not as dense as my other pole beans. Again because of the frost I lost about half of my crop. But what we have has really taken off, and I'm sure the Lord will bless um, with what we have here. These are the few plants that I grow in my greenhouse because they need a very warm environment to grow. So I have some cayenne peppers, and my sweet potatoes are in here. You see I have quite a few peppers. See some beautiful ones there. Aren't they gorgeous? And then my sweet potatoes. And a plug as to why 
not to use uh, weed killers. So let me back up and you can see the disaster of my greenhouse. <clears throat> All right. So on my property, we have about five different very hard to control invasive plants. We have quack grass, which is what most of our pasture is made of. The pasture that we are butted up against is mostly quack grass. And that sends out runners for like 20, 30, 40 feet or so. So um, even if you pull this up, there's runners that spreads this everywhere. So we have quack grass. Then we have this here is deadly nightshade. Um, this is the vining variety, and I can't remember what it's called um, exactly, this specific variety, but this is Deadly Nightshade, and it, like the quack grass, sends out runners for quite a few feet, 20, 30, 40 feet. And so again, even if you pull up what's right here, there's runners under the ground everywhere. So this spreads like crazy. Um, we also have Trumpet Vine, very beautiful vine plant flower for the hummingbirds it's gorgeous it too sends out runners for 20 30 40 feet and so uh, can be very very hard to control um, my husband earlier this week he came in here and he sprayed all of this all the ground with an organic weed killer does it look like he sprayed with an organic weed killer Absolutely not. So, you know, weed killers aren't exactly a good thing. If you get the synthetic weed killers, like uh, Roundup and stuff, sure, it might kill this. But again, with the type of invasive plants that these are, you're going to be fighting this constantly. And by continuing to put herbicides and things on the ground to combat this, you're just poisoning your ground, poisoning your water and your food supply, and you're not going to make a dent in these weeds. So the best way to deal with uh, stuff like this is the back-breaking work of just pulling them up constantly. And uh, for those who do the Back to Eden Roostout method, these invasive species that I've talked about, the quack grass and the nightshade, and the trumpet vine will bust through your barrier for back to Eden gardening. How do I know? Because I do back to Eden gardening. And no matter how much mulch, how much cardboard you put down to cover the ground and smother the weeds, these varieties of invasive weeds will terrorize you. So it's just something to think about and to contemplate that, you know, there's going to be some nasty weeds out there that no matter what you do, it's going to be a battle you're going to always have to deal with. All right, so that is my end of July, beginning of August garden tour. A lot of things are going on in the garden, some a little slower than others, but they're going. So I'm so glad that you followed me along on this tour today. If you liked the video, if you found it inspiring, make sure to give it a thumbs up. Thank you for being a part of the journey with me today. If you haven't already, click the subscribe button down below. I'd love to have you. We do all sorts of things here on the homestead. And I hope that wherever you are, you are wonderfully blessed. So until next time, everybody, bye-bye.